Welcome to today's webinar, Choosing the Optimum Remote Production Technology and Workflow. Thanks for coming. Now, handouts from all three participants are available on the right, and you can also ask any questions that you want to ask, and we'll cover those at the end of the webinar. Those that we don't get to, we'll send to the speaker that you identify, and then we'll answer them via email. Now, we have three speakers who will present in alphabetical order. We have Corey Benke, who will describe what I think is what's typically recognized as remote production, where you have remote ca camera signals beamed in via either satellite or, or uh, 5G or 4G into a central editing location where they're edited and, and, and broadcast from a, a traditional video mixer. And then we're going to speak with Anthony Burakis, who is going to walk us through producing with vMix. vMix is a desktop video mixing program, and he's going to bring signals in from different locations and then send them out from vMix. And then finally, we're going to have John Porterfield, who's going to tell us about producing with Easy Live, which is a cloud-based video mixer. So we've got one traditional video mixer, one video mixer on a, on a PC, and one video mixer in the cloud. So kicking things off is Corey, and let me give him presentation. Thank you, Jan. So yes, so we basically have a what some would call a traditional IP broadcast approach to um, our high level streaming. Now we use vMix as well. We use all best of breed software, Teams, Microsoft, whatever, whatever, whatever we need to use Zoom, et cetera. Uh, but in this case, I thought it was good for us to start with a broadcast workflow. Uh, in this case, the Tamron Hall show. So uh, Tamron Hall, as some of you know, it's an ABC show. So during the pandemic, ABC lost control of their control studios and they needed us to pick up the slack as it were. They sent Tamron to her location in uh, Long Island, uh, where she could be remote, coming beaming into us, uh, we could make the show and also the collaborators around her show, namely producers, teleprompter, operator, director that she had, could actually call the show and, and operate from their homes remotely. Uh, so let's just go through some of the things uh, that we did. So here's a description of the workflow. You know. It's a remote guest with video and audio, so in this case, a remote host. We had PTZ control, so we had an actual PTZ camera, a Panasonic HE-130 that we could control to get her shot right, make sure the lighting director was happy with her shot and everybody was happy with it. Mix audio and PTZ control and ATEM on-prem, so in our New York facility. Uh, other contributors, so it was really cool. I was in my office and I heard this woman uh, speaking with an Indian accent and she was on the side of the road using FaceTime from India, beaming in into our master control room talking to Tamron directly. So we can take other contributors via anything, like I was saying before, Zoom, Skype, WebEx, Teams, FaceTime, um, graphics. So they wanted broadcast graphics. So we actually utilized vMix. Uh, we could have an operator control vMix uh, remotely uh, into our switcher, key fill. Uh, the director could have a multi-view in the cloud so she could see all of her cameras available and call our technical director on the ground. And the prompter, the prompter was from Tamron's show. She was in her apartment and she was running a laptop prompter that was at LiveX uh, master control room. Communication. So one of the things that a lot of people kind of neglect when it comes to when you have a bigger, more advanced show is you have a lot of people that that need to communicate, need to communicate very effectively at, you know, making the show happen the way they need it to happen. And then to top it all off, what, what most companies use nowadays is a Zoom producer feed. So a feed, a Zoom feed, a Zoom meeting, everybody could go to to see the show, talk to each other, prep for the show, do the things they need to do uh, while not being in the space. The sweet spot applications, you know, shows where quality cannot be compromised, right? So. Uh, SRT and a lot of IP contribution protocols were created to replace satellite and fiber technology that's very, very expensive. Satellite having a four to five, you know, three, well, let's call it a 1.5 to four second delay uh, and fiber having no delay, uh, but it's very expensive, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars per channel per month. Uh, in order to have it. So also shows that need extra privacy and security. So uh, SRT is stands for Secure Reliable Transport. So you can actually encrypt the video. Uh, you can set uh, passwords on it. Um, and so for, for clients that require uh, privacy and security, uh, we're, you're able to do that. Sweet Spot producers, they have to be technically and broadcast savvy. Um, so we train our producers as specialists over time. And so they handle all of the different roles as they kind of build their way to the top of the pyramid mid and become a live producer. The key advantage over any other system is it's the best quality you can get over IP. 
period, end of story. There's a little bit more delay, but you can see the difference when you do a, a vMix call or a, a vMix call is a little bit better than StreamYard in my opinion, where the WebRTC protocol and the breakup, depending on what camera you're using. Um, but it's the best quality uh, utilizing IP if you're not using, utilizing fiber or you're in the, the place itself. Advanced control, there's no limit to contribution or distribution with this. Um, and it's the most like television. So here's an overview. We had Tamron, uh, our facility in Hudson Yards, uh, New York City. Um, pretty simple. Connectivity, uh, we have a, a dedicated internet, one gig fiber in Hudson Yards. We all have a dedicated backup. Um, one of the biggest issues was getting uh, really good internet. I have the same problem here. I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin right now uh, at a house that has spectrum. Um, and so um, I also have cellular failover, but it's very difficult for us to get really good upload speed as a lot of you with uh, consumer, uh, even prosumer uh, business uh, internet have experienced. Um, so we need six megs per stream. Um, and then ideally 12 megs up, so we've got a little bit of overhead for her camera, and then over 10 megs down, because obviously we're going to send her program feed, she's going to be able to see her guests, she's going to be able to hear people over IP, so she needs some internet to be able to handle that. So here's some looks, pretty typical uh, broadcast television, right? Uh, this show was live to tape, so uh, the editors took the show after. Uh, we cut it as live, so everything you see here was cut as live. You can see Tamron on the left, She's she's got a, a beautiful uh, HE, Panasonic HE-130 camera, which is now replaced by the Panasonic UV-150, um, you know, looking great. And you can tell her guest was on Zoom or on Skype or on something else. It's just a little bit, a little bit fuzzier, a little bit, you know, laptop top webcam camera um but this is really the show that we're making right one box into a two box not complicated but has to be you know Tam we want tamarin to look like the uh, multi-million dollar star that she is so here is our signal flow um and i'll just leave this up here uh it's not actually very complicated um a lot of what we use is high vision makitos uh for a lot of what we deploy so we have high vision makitos everywhere we have uh, a field unit called remote x that we've created that allows you to send you know send a box and you know pretty much give that box internet and we can get up to eight uh encoded uh, audio and video feeds back and forth multiple channels of audio communications um so that's what's here we had uh these two on the side and you have uh, ip between them that's what this this black mark uh, stands for. We had an X32 rack with her audio, a clear comm panel, um, so we're able to talk back to her. She's got a wired lav, and she's got a monitor and a stand. Now, a lot of the things that we were doing, she had a lighting, and in, in this case, she had a lighting director. She had a lot of people that had to get buy-in on the look that she had, so we had to send those signals to other people so that they could approve the look and, and make sure everything was good. And uh, again, uh, we're making this available as a PDF, so you can deep dive into exactly what we're we're doing you can see here is how we do contribution into the ATEM switcher so we've done in the last year and a half we've done a zoom farm and now we've made zoom gardens and really it's utilizing a PC for every zoom so that you can give the 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 guest talent um, mix minus control so we utilize Dante we made the zoom garden so that we can actually have mix minuses for all of the guests and we actually have a pretty cool system at LiveX with our zoom garden where to everyone it's a zoom but it looks a lot a lot um cooler than you know stream yard or a zoom um so these are the some of the things the he 130 pretty simple workflow for us um you know one camera in this case but a lot of complications going on a lot of things going on so we can have advanced control with the talent so equipment costs so here's where we're going to differ with the other two solutions a lot <laughs> um and that is you know cost of switcher so the atem constellations obviously ten thousand dollars the one the 2me panel that we have i think is 15k i don't have that on here you know we use production bot to run our vmixes which is a, a box that we actually have made for the last four years it's built like a tank it's it's a portable system to to i used to work at live stream so we had this product called live stream studio so it kind of came off the back of that of like hey i need to have i'm gonna have a software switcher i need to carry it around 
prompt your laptop. So this is all at the LiveX Remy, so in our master control room. Skype TX box, which I believe we had the quick link in that case. Our Zoom farm, our Makito encoder and decoder pairs, and Hyperdex to record. Uh, since since uh, Tamron, we now record most of our stuff in the cloud, unless the client has a ProRes requirement. In this case, the client had a DNX HD requirement for editing post. So we had to use the Hyperdex uh, to record all the ISOs and then get them into uh, send them uh, via IP to their NAS. Uh, and then the PTZ controller. On the host side, uh, we had a remote X system. Um, you know, it's approximately 40K of so of gear. Um, you know, the Makitos are very fairly expensive. I think you've seen in the last, you know, eight months, you've seen Magewell, you've seen um, Kilo View, you've seen a lot of manufacturers get into the SRT game, Vidion, Edgecaster, there's a ton, and I have a list of products that work with SRT now. Tons of, tons of, uh, of, uh, of manufacturers have SRT, so you don't have to go with a Makito. Keto, I, I would say as far as an SRT or RTMP uh, encoder, you probably have Elemental as like the top still, and then Makito's right up there as far as, you know, what the military and what broadcasters uh, tend to use. And then we have a product we created for the Democratic National Con uh, a Convention called Virtual Video Control Room. And what we use for Tamron for the director multi-view was an early beta of that product. And what that was is we were able to get the multi-view in SRT, but the director was able to look at it in near real time. So less than 600 milliseconds from uh, our send to her browser looking at the feed so that she could more accurately call cameras because latency is an issue with on-prem. The nice thing about on-prem versus virtualization, which I know we're going to get into in the next couple speakers, is on-prem, I like to say, it allows you to decide what the main show latency is going to be, meaning you can bring all of your feeds in and if you have to retime them, you can. Also, using Makito's, Makito, uh, High Vision has a new product that we've used for the last three years, new, I'm gonna use it three, for three years, called StreamSync. So if you have an SRT encoder and you have NTP, time code, you can actually set your decoder for NTP and you can get all of your streams. And this actually works within one frame of each other. So that if you're doing concerts, if you're doing uh, things where it's really mission critical that when you're making the show, you have time feeds to you. It's one of the really cool products out there that not a lot of people are using, um, but I think you're going to see more and more um, uh, as we as we as we keep moving through this remote workspace. So key advantages, pros and cons. Uh, there are uh, a ton of both. Um, you know, it is a best of breed IP solution. Atemi used to make uh, some products before and there's multiple, there's risk, there's other IP protocol channels you can use. Um, you know, right now I think most people in the broadcast space are using some kind of WebRTC product or some kind of SRT product. Um, uh, there's no limit on remote users, so the crew or advanced requirements like captioning and ASL, which, you know, SRT, uh, because of the pandemic, SRT has been kind of pushed into the remote contribution space. But one of my favorite things about SRT is that it is a brilliant, brilliant transmission protocol. It is a, brand, a brilliant offloading protocol for distribution. And I think you're going to see a lot of CDNs uh, adopt SRT. And the, well, the hope is they adopt SRT over at RTMP. That's a bet that some people have made as far as uh, ingest and codes. So the pros are broadcast quality, enormous flexibility. The cons are your talent. So we find that you know, unless you have broadcast talent, when I say that, like a news reporter, an anchor, you have a reason to have that higher quality uh, signal. A lot of talent can't handle the delay to and from the operator. So um, we've actually solved this uh, for in a lot of ways, old school, where we'll have everyone contributing with SRT, and then they're actually listening uh, on an on a POTS line, IFV line, or a, or a comms line, so that they hear what's going on. Um, what we found is that for people who are not broadcast talent. Uh, we tend to go the Zoom garden route because it's a lot easier for people to use a product like GoToMeeting or Zoom or Skype or whatever and give them a link to that and then just have them talk as naturally. And Zoom, because of the less than 200 millisecond delay and even vMix call, makes it a little bit easier for the talent. But 
that ease for the talent sacrifices an enormous amount of quality. And that includes Zoom HD, by the way. I thought, love Zoom. I love Zoom HD, but it still doesn't equal the fact that you can do 4K HEVC SRT at like four megs in under 400 milliseconds. You just can't, you can, you can green screen with that. You cannot green screen with Zoom. I know people are going to argue with me, but you can't at a high broadcast level and, and actually like, you know, you can, you can do it, but you can't do it at the level that we're talking about. So the other con is it requires multiple skilled operators and communication, uh, requires significant hardware and facility investments. So, you know, one of the things I'm, I love uh, is using, you know, communication systems that are built for broadcast military. So we're talking about RTS or ClearCom. So we have the ClearCom system, uh, a ClearCom matrix, uh, the matrix alone, like an Eclipse matrix, the box is $40,000. So clearly, but there are solutions like Unity um, that we use as well that are a little bit cheaper. So, you know, this, th this ultimately does have a significant hardware and a facility investment, um, which is probably one of its biggest cons besides the overall latency on the first mile that can happen when people have not so great internet. That's what I have. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to be faster uh, than Anthony now. I'm faster than Anthony. I guarantee it. I guarantee it now. So let me hand it over to Anthony and Anthony, take it away. Um, so to pick up what Corey was talking about, yeah, vMix is, is sort of like a Swiss Army knife. Um, it does a lot of things and people can use just a piece of it. You can use a lot of it. Um, I'm specifically going to talk about using vMix for remote production. Um, obviously, you know, you could do SRT in to vMix and you could do uh, a, a Zoom, a Zoom garden. I love that phrase. That's a really cool phrase. <laughs> a Zoom garden in, into, um, into that. But um, the reason I got, I, I started using vMix is because it's, there, it has its own call-in capability built into the app itself. So that you're not leveraging laptops and you're not leveraging um and srt hardware on the opposite end on the remote end it's just a browser and on the receiving end it's just vmix so uh let me click on that window so i can go to the next slide so what it does offer at the top level there's many different layers there's eight remote guests can call directly into the app and they show up as a separate camera a separate input for each person calling in in so doing, you get color correction, audio filtering. You can pre-position your layouts before they even call in because you know what the number is going to be, you know who it's going to be, and you can put that in all these, you know, pre-made, you know, multi-views. You have full control of the entire environment that you're working in. You can control the image size, the crop amount, where it appears on the screen, the audio levels, audio routing, audio filtering. You could also preload graphics, videos, and slides, obviously because it's a video mixing app. And it also offers a dynamic flow and movement between the elements. So you're, you're able to get that nice broadcast polish where things move back into a panel and come back out of a panel when you bring people forward. And you can even control what the remote viewers or the remote participants see and hear. It's they don't just get the program. You can pick from all the different things that are going on within vMix what they're going to get. And it's also very destination flexible, you know, whether it be, oh, I need to feed, feed this into my WebEx, or I want it to go to Facebook, or I'm just going to uh, send it to a white, a white, white, what do you call it, white label page via RTMP. You can, it doesn't, vMix doesn't care. Um, do, 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 I'm going to stop my counter. Now, <laughs> um, for the guests, this is what they see. It's a simple web page. You type in your name, and that's the name we see on the receiving end. Now you type in a password. It's just like a phone number, really. It's not you know anything out in America. And then you hit join call, and that's all they got to do. You can even pre-build these links with the name and the number, so when they click on it, it literally goes to this web page, fills in the stuff, and connects. So all they have to do is click a link. It takes a little bit of effort to do that, but of course, you know, if you're dealing with people that are not very technically sad, you can pre-build all of that. Now, the one key thing that it does give you by bringing these people in separately is control of what the capture looks like. For each caller, you can see the row of caller stats at the top. We can see what their resolution is, what the frame rate is, what the data rate is, the audio quality, the audio date rate. And then down below, you can see each of these people at the remote location are coming in as a separate connection. It's not Zoom. This is, this is our own multi-view screen. And then I can bring any of them up full because they're all coming in at, you know, up to 
1920 by 1080 if they have vmix on their end. If they just use vmix call, the maximum is 720p. One key thing that we do is sometimes we have panel event after panel event. So I can take a monitor on my computer, push it off to the side and give somebody else a little controller and they can with each button talk to each person. Hey, Mary, I see you. Thanks for calling in. Can you tilt your camera down a little bit? Can you close that door behind you? And, and onboard these people, you know, and I've given that to someone else, even though it's on the same computer, it's a separate monitor. He push him a couple of feet away and then he's able to dynamically talk to the people. I, well, I can have two people on and he's onboarding the next four. I have independent audio level, independent equalizers, noise gates, compression, filtering, and routing. You know, like if we have an in-studio guest, you know, we have the in-studio guest list, the output for the IFB for the in-studio guest is on B. So this way I can send which of these remote callers goes to B and which one doesn't. And then of course you don't want to have the in-studio microphone go to B so the host does not hear themselves in their own ear. With each input, you've got full color control. So again, you know, as Corey says, this is not Zoom, this is not, you know, StreamYard, you know, this, you're, you're leveling up, it becomes a lot more complex. And, you know, that's a good thing. And it's a bad thing. <laughs> so, you know, color correction, you can do green screen, and we have actually done green screen with the 720p feed. Yes, it's not going to be, you know, a 4k, you know, feed. But, you know, we, we've delivered, we've, we have had deliverables that the client was very happy with individual white balance, crop and zoom, and position for each input. So you can see we're able to do basically the same, hey, look, two boxes, two people talking, they got their own titles over a background. It doesn't look like zoom. And we have full control over the size of the boxes, where the titles appear, over them, under them, how they you know, blow in and blow out and things like that. Also, you have independent return video, return audio, you can control the bit rate of each return feed, which if, if you have to manage your bits, like Corey was saying, if you don't have a whole lot of bandwidth, you can manage that. And you have this for each caller. So we can pick from any of the four outputs that vMix offers. Here, I was doing a seminar for streaming media and I built a custom screen for me that I could easily put on any one of those returns where I can see the program, I can see the next slide, I can see my presenter notes, and I also put the chat from the actual you know, other window, and I windowed that and put it on this screen as well. I can put timers on here. You can put anything you want on there. So the next thing it makes gives you is control of your presentation. Obviously, you know, you can have custom arrangement of size, color, titles, and you're not just limited to the boxes. You want hexagons, you can go out there and buy templates to give you hexagons and all kinds of cool effects. You know, you could dress it up and make it fun. You could do circles if you want. <laughs> you know, if you want to have custom ways to bring on uh, comments, you can bring the comments right into the show and position them wherever you want them to be. Heck, go crazy with, I don't know even what you would call this form. And then, you know, my personal favorite is I actually bring in drop shadows. And I, you know, when I'm doing some presentations of my own, I give, that, give it a little polish with drop shadows. Controlling your destinations. As Corey was talking about, you know, he's, you know, sometimes you record, it's, you know, to tape, as they say, you're recording it, but then a lot of times they also want it, you know, here we're going to YouTube. So you can see this is the direct feed on YouTube itself. We can push it into video chat apps, WebEx, Zooms, Teams, using the virtual camera. In addition, when we talked about recording, you have two independent records at the highest level of vMix, and you can pick the format, the bit rate, the audio bit rate and everything for each of those two sources. You have three independent streams, so you can RTMP it out to three different locations. Now, obviously, the further you go with this, the more demand you're putting on the PC. That's why some people choose to take the streaming and put it you know, on another, another device. You have multiple outputs. You can have hardware outputs you know, via SDI or NDI or you can out, come out SRT, you can push your um, one of your four outputs out SRT to anywhere in the world. And of course, like I mentioned, you have virtual camera. And then of course, there's this multi-quarter thing, which basically says record everything. And then you really make sure that you've got a lot of hard drive space, a lot of different hard drives to put this on because you could really start ramping up on the hard drive demands. 
what are the costs to do this? Well, the software itself maxes out at $1,200, and that's a purchase. It's not a yearly license. They do have a new yearly uh, a subscription, which is $50 per month, which gives you the pro license for just $50 a month. So if you just need it for two months, you get it for two months, and you only paid $100. Um, to just get started, there's actually a free version, uh, which I kind of chopped off. There's a free version that just lets you play around with it. And once you start to understand what's going on, you can then buy into a higher license. You're going to need a PC to put this on. And again, as I've mentioned a couple of times, the beefier your machine, the more you can do. You know, it really relies on the GPU. It really relies on the CPU for different things. And the beefier machine you have, the more you can do. Or you can sort of offset things. You know, you can take all your streaming and put that on the second machine with one NDI sent to the second machine. And then the last, you know, cost is bandwidth because at 720p through vmix call you're coming only two megabits down maximum for each caller but then you also have the return fee for each caller so you have to add that up and then of course if you've got your master streams you want did you want to stream to three places well if you're doing a seven megabit stream that's 21 megabits just for that do you are you sending srt up or down are you sending ndi up or down plus you need a bit of headroom because that internet bandwidth is not always exactly 20 it might dip down a little bit and cause a little bit of problem. It all adds up. The last real cost I feel is time because vMix comes out, it's a blank slate. You open it up, there's two blank inputs and there's nothing. And you gotta learn the program or find someone who does. You know, There are um, the frequently asked questions, there's a manual online, there's a forum online, there are just copious amounts of getting started videos. And this is all just from vMix itself. They have all of this content available. And then there's tons more content outside of that. Now, to conclude, I think vMix has you know, certain obvious pros and cons. It's a low cost of entry, super easy for guests to connect, built in mix minus and customizable uh, return feeds, and pretty much low bandwidth needs in and out. The con 720 web RTC, it's not the highest quality out there. You know, it's it's just not. It's good, but it's not going to be what Corey is doing at 4K. Um, screen share is not integrated into VMix Hall. It's not a business chat app. It's a broadcast app. So if you want to do a screen share in addition to somebody talking, there are ways to do it, and we've done it. But it's not what this thing is built to do. And when you're sending streams back and forth, this web RTC is not as resilient as SRT. So if the, if the remote guest has got the bad bandwidth on their end, there's not a lot you can do about it. It's going to, it, it can get choppy and it doesn't have the resiliency of SRT and the extra data to buffer through those uh, challenges. And that's all I got. Wow. <laughs> thanks, Anthony. Yeah. Corey's as shocked as uh, anybody right now. I'm you shocked he got through all that. Can I, can I, <laughs> can I just say two things? Cause I really, uh, if you do want to get screen share into vMix, we have an app called Rivet that is an SRT app that allows you to screen share into vMix. So Anthony's case, he could actually take SRT from that. So I just want to plug my own software and it's only $24. <laughs> so it's very cheap. It's, it's the best SRT encoder for Mac, Windows, iOS, Android on the market. And then the second thing on the resiliency. So like we live and die on vMix. Uh, well, everything Anthony was talking about, we 100% live and die in. And when the pandemic first hit, we had this on the resiliency con um, is when the pandemic first hit, there was a network fluctuation and really bad networking because everybody was working from home. And so we had a couple shows fail on vMix because I think now Martin, the developer, has built in more ARQ and FEC functionality into the WebRTC. I think the WebRTC is a little bit more resilient now, but when it first came out, it was a little less resilient. So it's some, something when he said about the cons to be aware of. Thanks, Corey. Okay, John Porterfield is going to take us through uh, editing in the cloud via easylive.io. Fantastic. Can everybody hear me okay and can see my screen? I take it that's a yes. <laughs> uh, okay, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jan and uh, Anthony and Corey. You know, all, everybody here, you know, it's been fantastic to kind of watch a couple of these presentations and uh, just you know, kind of talk about vMix and about SRT. And actually, the the advantage of those types of technologies is actually they do kind of go into easylive.io. So 
Uh, I'm going to go through kind of what the, you know, who is it easylive.io, if you're not familiar who, who easylive.io is, as well as kind of the what and the how, right? And what is it and how does it kind of work? Maybe in an example of a case study of a show, a couple of production uh, examples that we've put together. So uh, real quickly about easylive.io, uh, they've been around for several years now. Uh, and uh, obviously it's a lot of the information, I put a link into the PDF. So this information, you can go to their website, learn more about the company, but essentially what easylive.io is taking the video mixing production elements and putting that into a cloud architecture. Uh, some might call it a software as a service, which essentially is what it is. And so vMix, those type of technologies and SRT become a way of contributing into the easylive.io architecture in a cloud format. So video sources, uh, remote guest, screen sharing type of activities, as well as scaling up the production into a higher level. Uh, and we'll show some of the examples of that. Uh, real quickly, uh, EasyLive.io has an extensive amount of number of customers. Uh, and again, you can visit their website, look at some of their case studies. Uh, I would encourage anybody, if you have more, you'd like to get information, uh, feel free to ask questions. I put my email address at the end of this presentation to reach out to me directly, uh, but feel free to go out to their website and take a look. So how does it work? So what is really EasyLive.io in, 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 in kind of a snapshot? Um, it's basically capturing the video sources and those video production elements that we've kind of covered today in, in the past two presentations, uh, and then being able to edit and produce that element in a video mix production within the cloud, and, in, and then distributing that uh, through a variety of different sources. This could be through a content delivery network like Akamai. It could be another type of social content-driven networks like YouTube, Twitch, uh, Twitter. Uh, as well as Facebook and others out there. So you, you have, have kind of a scale up option as I kind of look at easylive.io, which really is kind of an advantage of the technology to provide you an ability to take your signal acquisitions, we call it, that could be your remote guest, it could be through their sources contributing into the production, as well as taking like we've covered today about a vMix architecture and contributing into that uh, setup scenario and taking a live video source and actually utilizing uh, technologies or protocols and transport like with, with SRT. So what are the advantages of a 100% cloud-based all-in-one studio? Well, uh, you know, there's there are some trade-offs that you're taking in terms of moving it off-site, but in a sense, you're really kind of reducing the overall capital expenditure of type of hardware, right? We've talked about the acquisition costs you would need to acquire certain elements to run a production, and, and I would say in the past 19 months or so that we've been uh, with a lot of these transitions with the pandemic and different remote productions and things that have kind of been occurring over the past year or more now, uh, we, what we've now gone to is kind of a hybrid model where you can now take a, a solution like easylive.io and integrate that with various sources for the production and run that. That allows you to distribute that cost uh, in a sense that of maybe focusing the redeferring or deferring those costs or distributing those costs in a different areas of where you need to make the acquisition. And so there's no local uh, setup cost, right? Uh, and then there's scalability is unlimited. Uh, so in terms of when we talk about the cloud architecture, that's kind of the advantage of the cloud is you don't, you're not limited by the amount of capacity and certain elements of that because it's utilizing a infrastructure and a software as a service type component to give you a multi-user, multi-scalable type solution approach and doing that. And this is global, right? So with where we're at right now with everybody kind of doing their productions and different ways or means of how we deliver that. And, we, and we've talked about a little bit of that today. You know, we can bring a source in from anywhere in the world, right? We can bring that into the easylive.io architecture as a guest. Uh, as well as we can take a signal acquisition from maybe a remote site and as part of the overall production. Updates are automatic. And so, you know, that's the other advantage of, of with easylove.io is that your updates are also going to be automatic, right? You're not doing a software. They're going to come based on your plan and where you come in at. They're going to come and get updated frequently. So as they release new features, you're going to be able to take that and 
and take advantage of those new opportunities to integrate as part of your production. So where are the sweet spot applications? Well, you know, with easylive.io, easylive.io, uh, you've kind of got a, several different scenarios. You could do conferences, you could do talk show interviews, uh, press conferences. As an example of this, what you see here on this screen is when, you know, a lot of the productions went remote, a lot of events, remote hosts, different elements, you could take easylive.io and essentially have a fan wall concept that they've created and they've architected to pull in and have fans join remotely. Uh, you could have the game, uh, you can have a press conference or maybe a player kind of giving some feedback on uh, one of their games they, they participated in and the fans are there to, to kind of participate. So you kind of create this community effect with the fan wall, but you also have the ability to scale up the production to a higher level, right? And so there's a lot of, I would say advantages of this is that you're you have the opportunity to be able to pull different sources into your production and build that out as you need it based on what the need is. So that's why I use the term a lot in terms of, and I'll use it several times today in the presentation about scalability. So an example setup that I'll use here, this is just an example of where I, you know, and I'll use this uh, in terms of what I've done as a webcast producer and what I do with some other test projects and things that I'm working on with using easylive.io uh, recently, and we'll show that here towards the end. Uh, you could have the beauty of easylive.io, and as we talked about vMix and about your remote uh, teams and you know kind of spreading your team members out for the production, what easylive.io is to virtualize your master control room. And we kind of covered that a little bit today. Uh, Corey covered that with talking about you know, a virtual control room. So the webcast producer could be in one location and you could have another set of your team members in another location. So uh, that gives the ability to have a production in the control room, um, handling multi-streams, playlists like playing out like content as well as production and you bring in eight live sources. Now, the key advantage with easylive.io is that you can also uh, have multiple different operators in different parts of the control room. So it's not you're not limited to one control room. You could have another production that you've scheduled and another team that's managing that. So there's a lot of you know flexibility. Um, and I like to use in terms of a cloud term would be elasticity, right? And what does that mean? It just means that I can I can redistribute my me team member resources and apply them to support different productions for different clients. So this really kind of gives you an idea and then being able to pull people in remotely. I say Austin, Texas and Nashville. And like Corey mentioned, you know, it is important for the talent or the guests to have a decent internet connection um, today, <clears throat> excuse me, with eSlab.io. Uh, you can pull them over the remote guest feature that's using the WebRTC protocol. Um, but, you know, you want, do you want to make sure this decent um, configuration set up in terms of their ethernet. Uh, and I prefer, you know, we try to really focus on having a cable and using Wi-Fi as an option. Uh, a link is sent to the invitee. Um, so this isn't like where they have to install an app on their system itself. You can send an invite to them and they can join via remotely that link and you can pull them into a green in the production. And I'll show that here in just a moment. Uh, gear could be a webcam. I use this as an, uh, an example on this screen is an Elgato webcam face cam that just recently got released or you know one of the wave mics, right? So you don't have to have a really high-end setup, but obviously considerations need to be taken into account of what type of production this might be and what we need to be able to do to accomplish and bring quality in terms of the overall experience, whether we're capturing or live streaming. The TED, you know, kind of breaking it down in terms of the encoding process, when I talk about the scalability of easylive.io, you know, again, you it has a lot of versatility. So you can pull in, you know, the raw video, right? And you, what you see on this screen is you can design, uh, you can have live scoreboards, you can set up your image and titles. And so what you call your scene overlays, right? Uh, that could be custom that you create your own scenes or you can leverage something like from singular.live or other types of uh, vendors that work with easylive.io that you can pull into it. Uh, you can pull, as I mentioned, your remote guests via WebRTC. Uh, you also have a monitoring capability, right? 
So the cool thing about with easelive.io is you can have a return video return. So you can kind of see what's going on, how are things performing. Uh, cloud services, it has integration with obviously the other major cloud vendors like AWS, Amazon Web Services, or you know Dropbox. But you also see you have the main part of that pulling into it is your audio video mixing. So you bring everything into it, you can do that. And then you can set your format structure for your encoding prof profiles. And as I mentioned, they have a lot of their services are integrated as we've talked about with items like SRT, the Secure Reliable Transport, but they also support RTMP, HLS, and, and you can do multi-stream or multicast type distribution. An example of the control room that you'll see here in uh, with the NAB Amplify uh, event taking place next month that's kind of being prepared, this example you would see that, you know, on the you have layers. And so in the control room, when you go into it, you have kind of your preparation, what I call it phase, is your testing component. Um, and so in this, you're gonna have your first layer that you're seeing there is kind of the scene layers, right? And then you're gonna have different uh, video sources coming in, such as your invitees. Uh, you might have another layer that's covering your host, another set of scenes. And then um, some videos, obviously, that you're being pulled in. And then you can add your, you know, host name, playlist, play out for playing like a, a maybe a B-roll set of material that you want to show before the event starts. Maybe it's an intermission and you want to drive that video. Uh, so, you know, you get the kind of the idea or the, hopefully the sense here that you can kind of scale this as far as you want to go. Uh, now, it can get somewhat complex. And that's where, you know, you want to make sure you have the right set of team involved obviously more than one person managing an event, making sure, but you do have kind of the opportunity to uh, make sure that you can, you know, produce a high quality show. So I wanted to talk about uh, a case study, uh, an example of a show that I recently participated in. Uh, and so in this example, uh, we took a concept of what we call Formula One quiz show, we pulled in fans, we pulled in uh, participants. And so you see Ramon and Deborah, Steve and myself. Um, I was the host along with Deborah. And uh, I will go ahead and start the playing here and I'll make sure I mute this. So what you'll see in here is that we actually produced a show. We showcased, you know, taking a, a intro. You'll see the screen here. Um, and, the, and then we come in and you see the host and the co-host which is myself and Deborah. Now, obviously, you know, you're going to have different degrees of video qualities we've talked about, right? Based on location, internet connectivity, types of video, uh, you know, like webcams or higher, you know, so obviously you need to take into consideration the type of what you need for your talent and guests. So in this case, Deborah actually was located over in France. Um, I was located here in Southern California out of, out of Irvine. And so, uh, the other producer view of it, you're going to see, you'll see the mixing, you can set all your audio sources, you can uh, listen to each ind individual audio source, kind of similar to vMix, um, as well as you can also make sure and see the view of your production. And then there's a multi-view, right? And in this, in that example, we can actually not only have the multi-view where everybody can see each other in terms of the participants and the fans, but we can also chat offline with those. So there's a lot of versatility in, uh, into this process. And that's what I like about easylive.io is you can really kind of take these different sources and pull them in and really produce a good quality show. But you also have the option to scale that up as you need it. And I think with uh, technologies like SRT, as it's become more pervasive in terms of uh, its adoption in the industry, and as we've talked about that today, and vMix is another contribution source you can if you have a higher level of production, you can absolutely take that and contribute that into an easylive.io. All right, and we'll go to the next one. And we'll stop this, sorry about that. So uh, in this, you'll see the, the remote guest experience. We talked about that, there's the fan view. This is what they would see here and you can kind of be able to, to uh, do that. So we actually had four different people in this uh, example, and that was Michael from Montreal. He was actually helping running it. Uh, a couple of the people from over in Europe, France, London, 
uh, and another person out of this, out of California. So what does the equipment cost look like, right? What is the general, you know, kind of setup and procedure for this? If you were to implement this and leverage something like Anisilab.io, well, it's built on an annual basis in terms of an annual contract. So there's an, uh, the acquisition cost or terms of the purchasing uh, processes, you pay for the annual uh, contract up front. Uh, and then there's a per hour pay as you go model in terms of when you're using and doing the production. So when you're testing and you're doing a live stream, you're obviously going to pay a per hour charge. Now, some people would say, well, you know, how would this benefit? Well, you can kind of gauge the production on your per hour fee and you can actually make sure that, you know, uh, you only pay it for what you use. So you're not paying for a lot of other equipment. Uh, so you're kind of deferring those costs. And that's why I so say you're distributing that into a model that's scalable and you use what you need when you need it. And then you can um, scale it back and, and do that. Uh, so there's an estimated cost to get started, uh, different support tier options. Uh, obviously, there's add-on considerations you could pull into this that we've talked about today. Encoders, software contribution type, encoder type systems. vMix is an example of that. SRT, we talked about those type of, of systems. You could have a teleprompter. You know, there's a lot of versatility to the, I talk about this. So when I do a lot of uh, work in these different productions, um, you know, there's, you know, kind of, different areas that we can kind of go into and scale up the operation as we need to go into it. And obviously there's pro options you can pull into the, uh, the, the solution. Host example would be, you know, I use as an example for host, could you get something, what would be the basic setup for a host or your talent? You could actually have, you know, an Elgato type configuration setup. And I use this as an example, a green screen if you needed it, or, you know, obviously if the environment stage for the environment, all the better. Uh, to eliminate the green screen um, and having good in ear, in ear headphones and those type of uh, advantages there. There's other add-on add -on considerations that I've covered in the document as well. So what are the key advantages and the pros and the cons? Well, the key advantages to this is that you can build your show on show setup, right? You can build it as you go along. Uh, cost reductions is you can replace part of the CapEx and OpEx, as we talked about, reduce travel costs for the people in terms of your team members, uh, the production for those that are participating in the event. Uh, you, the complexity for participants is actually easier, and we talked a little bit about that today, where you know technologies like Zoom or Skype or GoToMeeting or other types of web conferencing solutions, you know, again, we're sending a link to the participant to, to come into that and work with them. Uh, you have agility to, you know, be able to move and, and pivot, so to speak. Uh, you have production flex flexibility, and then you can secure these feeds, right? Uh, now, there are bandwidth requirements. Uh, you know, the operator's device is only as the controller, right? We're managing this in the cloud. So, you know, you, it, it's basically being managed at a higher level. So the bandwidth requirements are more about, you know, maybe where the talent's located, pulling in for the video feed and those type of contributions. Uh, so, you know, you have a quality broadcast tool in the pro sec section of it, uh, and then you have the flexibility and resiliency of the cloud architecture. The cons are, we've talked a little about that, you know, there is the adjustment when you're bringing thing, items into like SRT and different elements, you're going to have to make adjustments for that. Um, there are limitations of certain features and physical setups, but, you know, limitations of certain features when I refer to this is that, you know, there, as EasyLive.io adopts and integrates new types of features, they're going to make it better, right? And that's the beauty of the cloud. So as they release new features, you can take advantage of that and obviously make sure that you can um, integrate that into your production. With that, I would like to thank everybody, and I appreciate it. Any questions, please let me know. I'll hand it off back to Jan. Thanks, John. And uh... Thanks everybody, those were great presentations. We've got several questions. Um, start for, with Corey. Um, all the panelists have spoken about SRT. What is SRT and, and why is it better than RTMP? Give us that in like two minutes or less. Okay, so SRT stands for Secure Reliable Transport. Uh, the big difference between RTMP and SRT is that RTMP is based on the TCP protocol and SRT is based on UDP. 
So UDP is what, uh, when I'm playing a game and I've got a controller and I'm making sure my zombies are killing your zombies, I'm utilizing UDP to, to make that happen. And UDP just sends the signal and, it, and I don't check to see if I got the signal. That's a really quick, down and dirty, non-technical way to say it. Um, and so what SRT has done is they've said, hey, I'm going to take this protocol. We're going to put it on UDP, which UDP is what the Internet wants, right? That's what the, the Internet is made to travel those signals. And what they did is they added this, this piece of technology called ARQ, um, which uh, basically sends all of the packets along one packet for, for, for to not get too technical. But. In in essence, it's hard because you the best way that I describe ARQ is showing the ARQ diagram because it took me like it took takes me like two minutes looking at an ARQ diagram to really understand what's going on. But in essence, it's sending packets ahead and behind so that if any packets are lost, it the decoder makes up the packet signal and the loss, which is why the brilliance of SRT actually is if you need a more reliable signal you increase the latency, which there's a fundamental misunderstanding that people have about SRT as a remote contribution because it is, while it is true on the first mile, if your first mile is shit, and I'm sorry, I know I'm not supposed to say cuss words, sorry, Jan, that was my bad. Um, but if your first mile is bad, right, and, and it's just crap, what you do is you increase the latency. Well, as a remote contributor, increasing the latency is not good. However, by increasing the latency, the signal quality will, will get stronger. And that's what I was bringing up in Anthony with WebRTC, which WebRTC is so great, right? It's really fast, but the packets are stripped. Uh, so many things are stripped out of the signal. The, the GOP structure is always changed. It's not really like true video the way we know it. It's good enough video always, right? It's why, you know, when you watch a webinar, you watch Zoom, it's not that great. Um, the, the, the differences that I see, and I know you didn't ask this, but because uh, UDP has ARQ and because, because SRT is over UDP and has the ARQ, it tends to be more resilient than WebRTC over time. Now, Zoom uh, has probably done the best job of anybody making WebRTC bulletproof in some ways because uh, they've had all of these other things onto WebRTC that have made it so much better, as well as like going back to audio when your video's crap. Um, but I think in a nutshell, that's SRT. Uh, did I miss anything on that, Anthony? John? No, I think the forward and reverse error correction is the key thing, and the latency gives you more of that. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. Anthony, oh, the other thing, uh, though, I will say, Jan, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The big thing about SRT that I do think is really important uh, over RTMP specifically, RTMP is not codec agnostic. And SRT is completely codec agnostic. All, all SRT is doing is transporting the packets. It doesn't care if you have HEVC. It doesn't care if you have H.264. It doesn't care what you have. And that's kind of a really brilliant thing. By, by separating the, the video and audio transports from the protocol, uh, it allows you to have a much more resilient signal and allow for future proofing, right? Um, Okay, Anthony, for you, for you, a couple of questions. Number one is, um, do you recommend, or, or with vMix, do you think people can do this by themselves, or should they always hire an operator? And I guess, you know, since you're an operator, we'll, we'll, we'll see what your answer is. And also, you know, broadcasting from the home leaves questions about uh, redundancies and failure. So what's the single, single most common point of failure you're seeing, and how do you protect it against that in that type of production? All right, uh, I'm going to start with the first one, and you're going to have to repeat the second one. Um, <laughs> first one is, you know, should I try this at home, or or is it just too complex? Well, the, the single operator, and um, yes, uh, I've I've done many shows by myself. It, it all really comes down to preparation. I mean, with vMix, you could do a live switch, and you can get a big controller with a camera for every button and stuff like that, or you could actually build your show with scenes. And then you literally just go from one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. It, it really simplifies things. And then you can add automation. Here's my pre-show. And then when I go, dissolve from pre-show to camera one, it actually fades out the audio, fades in the audio, brings up the IFB, starts to record, and does 10 different things. So if you've got a regular show, you can automate 50 or more percent of it. And it really simplifies it so that one person really can do it. 
if you're doing a live thing where you can't pre make anything, then having separate operators, you can put uh, the audio controls on a control surface and hand that off to somebody. You can put the remote callers on a different screen and hand that off to somebody. Or like, you know, uh, John was talking about in the cloud, you can actually, you know, people have put vMix in the cloud and then have multiple, multiple people connecting into that machine and operating different aspects of what that's doing. So it can be one person. And if it's a simple enough show, you know, one person, I've done many, you know, two, three, four, five connection shows, but you know, then it depends on how much time there is between panelists. If you've got to onboard a panel while you're doing a panel, well, you can't live switch something and also have other conversations with other people. So you kind of have to find other ways around that. At DHD, we actually have two high-end vMix setups next to each other, and we can ping pong between them and then run NDI so that somebody can onboard eight while we're doing eight. And then when we're ready for that one, we just, he sends his output over to us and we just switch to, you know, the second system. So, you know, you can scale it, you know, where it's not the cloud, it's your cloud, it's your cloud and your room, you know, um, you can scale it. Um, the second question was redundancy, yes. And it, it, that is definitely a concern when I run things uh, here, you know, in the studio at DHD, we actually have two band, you know, two broadband. Neither one of them is like, you know, gigabit fiber. You know, we don't have Google fiber here in Dallas, uh, but they're both very high bandwidth connections. And then you can either use hardware or software to bond those two things together. You know, we have a, a PEP link hardware router so that you can actually have those two Ethernet connections and a cellular connection and a second cellular connection all bonded together as our connection to the internet. So should that one of those things go down, it shouldn't interrupt our uh, ingest and output into our studio. Okay, thanks very much. Um, this one for John. John, I've seen your YouTube productions and you always have very good quality. Uh, overall, how do you ensure that the guests look good and sound good when you invite them and, and get them on camera. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. That's an excellent question. Um, so, you know, I, I, we've talked a little bit about this day, you know, we've all talked about preparations key, just like we do this webinar, right? We've all got to make sure uh, one of my, one of my stipulations is test and preparation, uh, make sure we're ready to go. So one of the things I, I do is I, I actually produce, uh, a document that I work with my guest uh, when we pull them in there and make sure that we test their camera, their internet, their audio, right? We get a good example. Um, we test their, uh, I mentioned in my presentation, and I, I missed it, in your headphones, right? We want to make sure there's no loop back, you know, any echoes, things coming across during the stream. So I work really hard to do those things and pull that into the production. Uh, whether it's using something like Easy, Easy Live IO, where we're pulling somebody as a remote guest, or I'm using another tool that could be vMix, right? I think you know it's kind of universal, right? You need to make sure and do the preparation across the board. I don't think there's any you know one particular or, or other, uh, but I work really hard in terms of the productions and the folks that I've worked with uh, to determine the best way we can do that, uh, just to ensure that we have the optimal setup and when we're running that to go. So. Uh, preparation test and then the day of we just make sure that you know we give a, a certain amount of time to do that um and i also give recommendations to my talent and guests i kind of mentioned this uh a lot of times if they don't have the right microphone they don't have the right video you know could we get them a kit like an elgato camera with the microphone could we help provide them weight you know options so that we can improve the quality level for the experience of those that are watching whether it's captured or live but also for their experience as well in participating. So we're not having to do a lot of heavy lifting and we don't make it too complex for them. Hopefully that answers the question. Good. Okay, that's all we have time for. Um, Corey, Anthony, and John, thanks for taking the time to prepare and, and giving such great presentations. Thank you all for coming to the webinar. It'll be available um, online soon and you'll, you'll get notice of that um, in, in the email that follows this. Thanks for coming and uh, I uh, hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And...